what's going to be? How's it hanging? How's it happening? You guys know this is Kevin from the Card Progression Podcast. Hey, everybody. It is Thursday, the 19th of January. Tomorrow, the band we have in the podcast today is releasing their second album called East Coast, West Coast, In Between. So how cool is that that you get to hear us and join us as we talk with a band right before their album drops. <gasps> oh yeah. Before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor for this podcast, which is Phoenix Fitness. Yes, we are in January. Yes, those New Year's resolutions. Are you guys still doing well with them? Especially if it's, you know, get healthy, lose some weight, hit the gym, all that good kind of stuff. I get it. I get it. I hit the gym a lot too. You guys know how I do it because I want to stay mosh pit fit. Yeah, you guys know me. I love mosh pits. I will go in them. I will be in there for the whole entire set and I will not leave until that set is over. And then I'll go back and do it again because I just love that stuff. So in order to make sure that we are staying mosh pit fit, going to the gym a lot, you know, working out, lifting a lot of weights, doing a lot of cardio like six days a week. And then seventh day when you rest, I'm in the sauna like crazy. But I got to make sure that I have the proper tools to prepare right and recover right with my body so that I can do all these things. And that's where Phoenix Fitness comes in. They have a lot of great different supplements and fitness products in order to make sure that you are achieving your fitness goals in 2023 and getting mosh pit fit with this guy so what do they have they have different pre-workouts both stim and sim free i use their stim free pre-workout because you guys all the energy i have in this i really don't need to be hyped up any more than i already am so stim free there it is for me different bcw recovery compounds to help your muscles absorb all the nutrients post-workout they have a bunch of different types of protein supplements whey protein collagen protein plant-based protein I use their whey protein stuff, so big, strong protein, yeah. They have different like, types of creatine, multivitamins, literally anything you might need to achieve your fitness goals, Phoenix Fitness has for you. Our listeners of yours get 20% off using the code CPP20 at FNXFit.com, link description of the podcast. Now, today for a feature presentation, the band is called Fastest Land Animal. We have Screaming Jack Novak on the podcast. This band, I don't know how to describe them. You'll hear in the intro with all the stuff when it comes to like their styles, I mean, they, this is a this is a band where you have to say how do you describe fast land animal that's how you describe them. just just by their name because nothing else sounds like them we talk about their brand new album east coast west coast in between coming out literally the day after this podcast on january 20th 2023 we talk about the production side of a lot of these things and how these guys kept the human element in there using analog synths for some of their songs using more of this rougher style distortion how they produce them the types produced they use and just a whole bunch of different stuff about song production songwriting that we really have not gone deep on the podcast with until now so are you guys ready because this one was a good one let's go yeah well 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 ladies and gentlemen boys and girls listeners of the court progression podcast how do i describe this band's style I honestly have no idea. The best way to describe it is, it's just crazy. Rock, punk inspired, a lot of distortion, a lot of synths, no regards to the rules, gutter punk, rock and roll, off-kilter pop, pop, funk, pop rock, punk rock, late 70s style, early 80s style. Just to put it this way, this band can do literally whatever they want in music, and it's going to make sense. Their second album called East Coast, West Coast, In Between comes out on January 20th, and... We're going to talk all about, so please welcome from the band Fastest Land Animal, Screaming Jack Novak to the podcast. So Screaming Jack, welcome to the Core Progression Podcast. Thanks for having me, Kevin, and I'm happy to be here. Happy to have you on. How has everything been going in your world? Is of course, you know, 2023 is kickstarting that off. You guys got a new album coming out to kickstart the year. So how has everything been going on your end as we get towards that release? Uh, things are going great. We've got a couple of singles out uh, now. We've got Out of Range was the first single out, and the second one is Cowboys in Nashville. And uh, I am just sitting uh, sitting up here in, in upstate New York in my home studio, waiting for this big snowstorm that's supposed to hit us just in time for the holiday travel season. Just in time for the ho- yep, because as we're recording this, I am currently supposed to be getting hit that exact same snowstorm right now here in Wisconsin. Yeah, we're kind of not getting it. So I'm happy with that and happy to listen to some music and happen to talk to Mr. Screaming Jack Novak. So you guys have a lot of good stuff coming up. You guys have had a couple of singles out already for East Coast, West Coast, in between. And a lot is already, you know, coming from you guys. So what, so far, those two singles have been released. What has been the reception from not only the fans, but from people that are just hearing about the band with those two singles? Uh, so far, every, everything's good. This is our second album. And uh, 
you know, the, both of these albums we we're doing incognito, as it were, with uh, with our, with stage names and uh, trying to like just release an album without anyone knowing who we are and just trying to like imagine what people think about the band. And we've been compared, uh, and I'm happy about it, to bands like Eagles of Death Metal and Queens of the Stone Age and people aren't sure who we are. And is, is that some of the people from those bands or uh, what's going on here? And that, that was kind of the idea, just to have a, a side project, which is now our main project. Um, and all of us go into it with uh, adopting these characters and these, uh, these you know, kind of cool names that we've come up with. I mean, it's just a good way to go about it as well. Plus, when it comes to just the style of music with you guys being compared to like Queens of the Stone Age as well, I mean, that's just a huge comment. But that doesn't even strat scratch the surface of what other sounds can be compared to your sound. And it's just com in comparison by saying you listen to a song, you listen to a certain point of song. There is so much you can pick up on. Like when I was listening through <coughs> East Coast, West Coast in between, I was picking up like, okay, Here's some like 80s punk sounds like this kind of felt, felt like, you know, came from like that British punk scene, like the clash. Then there's some stuff I'm like, you know, this kind of would fit in with, you know, 60s rock, like Rolling Stones with the Beatles, with the Beach Boys. Then I found someone I'm like, wait a minute, did this be, I think there was one song I might, I, I'll have to look through my notes. I know I wrote it down, but it was like, we're going like 60s rock to all of a sudden melodic math rock, or like Rush inspired. <laughs> and I'm just like, my head's spinning at this point. It's Every song I'm picking up on a completely different, you know, potential influence, potential reference where I have no idea, like, where to put you guys in that realm of where do I put them outside of just fastest land animal is literally its own thing. And I don't think I've heard anything like it. Well, thanks. I really appreciate that, Kevin. Uh, you know, I've listened in preparing to write music for uh, this album and the last album. Uh, which is just self-titled Fastest Land Animal. I listened to a lot of uh, Steve, Steven Van Zant's Underground Garage, um, which I love. And, you know, I, I'm, I try to write songs uh, for Fastest Land Animal that would work well on the Underground Garage. You know, so there's definitely the whole 60s rock and roll vibe. Um, for sure punk, like punk's a big part of of my life growing up and the other guys in my band i mean i was uh like the ramones and the clash just were immense influences for me um and then later on husker du now we're into the 80s that that you know that that kind of changed my life because i realized that someone could make really ugly sounding music but the music itself was really pretty and that just that kind of was crack the code for me and that that's what i've strived to do ever since to make really gnarly sounding music but make it make the music itself you know try and try to have the music be pretty and poppy and catchy and that's a pretty tough thing because you think about you know punk especially in the 70s and 80s a lot of it had this rougher distortion to it where it was gnarly but there was no polish on it. It was just as raw as possible as in DIY as possible. So when you're coming in, you're influenced by that and you're trying to put you more of that like pop spin on it as well. It comes through with some of that gnarly feel to it. However, it's much more, it's not only much more accessible, but it's much more potential, you know, fun in terms of just what you're able to play around with playing around with these synths playing around with different guitar tones playing around with different vocal styles different vocal patterns different vocal tones and just anything else you want to potentially throw in there it gives that gnarly feel to the core of every single song but it allows you again to expand in so many different varieties where you're going to go through these songs and you're going to again pick up on all these different potential references from all these different other artists that you might be able to pick up on it's like Oh, I don't know how the hell they put that in there, but they did. It absolutely worked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, since you mentioned since we're that was a big part of this record, <clears throat> um, even more so than the last record. I mean, it's it's guitar driven music for sure, but um, I I happen to have a, a a few analog vintage synths. As I don't I don't know if people are not probably not watching this, listening to it, but behind me are some of my Moog synths that I have here and. I've got a Jupiter over to my right off camera. 
Um, but there's something about um, an an like specifically an analog synth as opposed to a digital keyboard that just has this like the oscillators create this really fat, chewy sound that we use like um, we used on a lot of different things, but specifically for like the bottom end of the album. If we were going to try, if we're geeking out here over uh, engineering and and uh, the the recording process, and to supplement just the bass guitar, you can get this really fat, huge sound from an analog synth um, that's really low end, and it it's you hear it, but you also feel it like when your rib cage rattles when something's so loud and low. And uh, that was like a really critical part of uh, some of the sounds in this record. And, uh, you know, that and you can there's I mean, there's great digital synths out there and people record, you know, on Pro Tools and and uh, uh, digital audio workstations and use uh, plugins. But there's really no substitute for an actual analog synth with the oscillators creating sounds and you can detune the oscillators and make it a almost chorusy sounding there's just a lot uh it, it's really inspirational to, to play around with these with this with this gear and that makes a lot of sense to use those analog synths as well and mess with the oscillators for that because when you take a look again with just the different influences and the different styles that you're working with on this album and all the different things you're putting in there, especially with much more of a closer connection to some of that 70s and 80s style, you don't want to have a digital synth in there because you can get those plugins, you can get it as close as possible, but there is such a subtle difference <coughs> between creating something digitally and having it you know, curated to that sound or having the original thing. There's going to be a little piece of of that original thing that that digital thing cannot get. So using those yeah. analog synths makes so much sense for this album, so much sense for your style. And on top of it, when you listen to it, you do get that feel. Because I'm thinking about it this way. You take a listen to music that came out in the 80s where it was heavily synth-driven, and that synth has a very unique sound to it. Now you look at a lot of things that may be going in pop music today that use a lot of synths. Sure, it does have a strong resemblance to it, but you can tell there is a slight difference there between the style of synth that has been used in the A's, which is primarily analog, versus the style of synth that's primarily used now in uh, music creation, which is more digital. Yeah, I mean, it's like going, stepping into a time machine. You're, if you're going to go and, and try and recreate you know, some of those, the, the sounds of those bands that you grew up with and that you love and that were inspirational to us, you know, The Police. Uh, we actually have a cover of a Police song on this album. Uh, the song... Um, uh, uh, next to you, which is their first song on their first album, um, and uh, if if you go back and listen to that music and try and recreate what was happening back then, um, you want the same gear that they used, and that's gonna like lead you to that place a lot more quickly than if you're trying to recreate that sound with other gear that didn't exist back then yeah because if you're using other gear that didn't exist back then you have to basically re-engineer that whole entire idea you have to re-engineer that whole entire sound and recreate it before you can start working on messing around with it to make that sound a thing but if you have the original gear you have the gear that they would end up using you end up already having that 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 core construction there so when you're trying to play around with the sound and if it's going to be a cover as well to mess around with it so that you can make it your own while still being able to have it have that same exact motive and feel of the original yeah you're going to want the same gear it just makes sense totally and uh you know it's funny because it also forces you to create things in a little more um structured way like for example when i did this the i do a keyboard solo on the bridge of the police cover that we do on this album and uh on the actual on the police track it was a guitar solo but i basically recreated uh what andy summers did on that song but i did it on uh this keyboard right here this uh moog uh analog synth but um the patch i used is monophonic meaning you can only play one note at a time you can't play more than one note like you would on like on a regular piano so that forced me to have to do two separate tracks <clears throat> because uh the line i was playing 
uh, was a harmony of two lines put together. So I had to do one track first, record that, and then play another track over it on the same keyboard, same patch, just a different track. So, you know, that, but that, that's kind of the fun part of it, that you're creating things, you know, you're backing into it instead of just playing it and it's perfect and you can, you know, there's uh, something called uh, MIDI, which if you're playing uh, like a, a, a synth patch um, on a plugin, you're probably playing in MIDI, which means you can play it and it, maybe it's a little sloppy, but you can go back and fix it later. You, you don't have that luxury when you're using an analog synth. You play it live, live to tape or live to your computer. And uh, what you play is what you have. You can go back and re-record it, but you can't go and move the notes around and what's called quantizing, which means you, you line up the, the notes so they're perfectly in rhythm. You can't do all that with, um, at least not easily, with an analog synth. And that, that's, again, that's more of the fun part of it. And it really uh, brings a human element to, to the playing um, instead of, you know, I, I don't love music that is so perfect. I like a little imperfection in my music. I mean, one of my favorite artists of all time is Neil Young. And there's nothing perfect about what he plays, his guitar solos, his tone, his voice. It's all a little, little off kilter, but in the best of ways. Uh, but his songwriting couldn't be better. The songs couldn't be better. And uh, just listening to him do it his way is, uh, I think, a lot better than listening to something that sounds perfect and uh, auto-tuned and just, you know, it's like something you would hear on American Idol or something. I, I, I like the human element to, to music. That's, you know, Bob Dylan's the same thing. He's, he has some of the best songs ever written and... You know, you wouldn't say he's uh, the greatest singer ever, but it doesn't matter. Um, Mick Jagger, too. Mick Jagger has a cool sounding voice, but it doesn't, it's not perfect. But you don't want it to be perfect. You want it to sound like Mick Jagger because that's, that's what is good about it. Oh, absolutely. It's what, and you said it perfectly with the human element behind it, because I'm thinking about it myself as well. Take a listen to a lot of like pop music that's out there. I really just don't resonate with it well, or really don't listen to it and can't connect with it. And I think a major reason is because that, that human element is taken out of it with the production being so digitized and the production being so perfect in every step of the way. Every note has to be perfect. If it's not perfect, they're going to go in during mixing and mastering to edit that to make sure that that is absolutely perfect. The vocal pitch, the vocal tone, everything has to be spot on perfect, but it's all digitally enhanced to get to that point, or mostly. And when you get to that point, that human element is gone. It's we don't we can't connect with it because now the true emotion of where those instrumentals are coming from, where the production is coming from, where the vocals are coming from. That human element is gone. We're losing on that connection to emotion. So we listen to this stuff and it just it's harder to connect with it. Now when you have something that's a little bit more imperfect or you have that human element still in there, you can hear the vocal tone in those singers. You can hear the roughness of the distortion of those guitars. You can hear the human element in there and we connect with it so much. Mick Jagger is a perfect example. Bob Dylan is a perfect example. Two very different voices, two very different style singers and you listen to them. But everything that they're singing, it's like you can feel that in a, such a strong way. And you look at a lot of stuff, that's bad, especially with me, with listening to a lot of rock and metal. It's when I get into that kind of stuff, it's hearing some of these vocals, that, especially when they're rougher, grittier, darker, deeper. They, it adds so much more emotion to it and it adds much more of a human element to it where if you auto-tune someone, you know, unclean screaming on a metalcore song, uh, I don't know if that would really go well. I mean, really if we're talking well. about, I mean, think what... What are the greatest metal albums ever? I mean, obviously, uh, Paranoid, Sabbath. Yep. <clears throat> but think about Master of Puppets, right? Metallica. That is, I mean, that is not a, uh, a uh, I wouldn't say it's a polished sounding album, but I wouldn't change a thing about that. That album's just just badass from top to bottom. And it's, it's because the performances and the songwriting and, and just, you know, the the sheer anger and, and visceralness of it. Um, but it, you know, it sounds, doesn't, it's not polished. The black albums is polished. 
which is also a great album. But, um, you know, for my money, I'm, I'm master of puppets all the way. Uh, understandable. And it's I understand, you know, as bands continue to grow, as artists continue to grow, as they have much more, especially when it comes to production side of things, when it comes to recording, they have more of a budget to work with this stuff. So you have more yeah. chances to polish it, to make it sound a very specific way that you want. But you have to toe that fine line between having it polished enough to the point where it sounds exactly the way you want it to sound versus taking that human element out of it and keeping that human piece in there so that that further connection is there. Because even some of my favorite albums as well, it's much more, it's further in a band's uh, discography further earlier, or I say earlier on, just because there's a little bit more of a roughness there. There's a little more of this grittiness there. And it just sounds a little bit to me like, you know, even the production side as well, it has a little bit of a potential DIY feel to it. It has a little bit more of that, you know, this is just who we are instead of just, okay, we recorded this stuff, we kicked ass on it, and mixing and mastering, we wanted to make it sound as perfect as possible. I still do like some of those albums, but the human element is still present at some point. If that human element is gone and it's so over-the-top produced, perfected everything, that's when, for myself specifically, I'm pulling away because it's so much harder to mentally, emotionally connect with that song or connect with that album. Yeah, I mean, like... uh... Take the Foo Fighters, for example. You know, their first record was Dave Grohl in his basement. Uh, I think Greg Dooley uh, from Afghan Wigs played rhythm guitar on one track. But other than that, it was Dave Grohl in his basement. It's basically all of his demos. And that, you know, that stands up as, uh, I mean, I think my favorite Foo Fighters album. But then, <clears throat> you know, cut to whatever it is, 15, 20 years later, they do Wasting Light. Um, and they are already up a huge stadium rock act. They've worked with the greatest producers in the world. They definitely have a polished FM radio arena ready rock sound, but then they go back and record on tape instead of uh, doing it digitally. And then that album kills. It sounds awesome. And it, I mean, it sounds, doesn't sound like a demo, demo recordings at all, but I think the analog aspect of it, that they recorded it on tape, like, brought this humanity and just this um this immediacy to it that um really i think i I think it sounds it's it's one of their best albums i'm so glad you brought that up too because i would i have to absolutely agree wasting light (laughs) is probably one of the best food fighters albums and a lot of it is because of the way it was recorded analog on tape everything to where they went back to those roots of just really recording it with that human element so heavily present in there and you listen to some of those songs and they just stand out with such power, with such grace, with such emotion based off that. I mean, Walk is probably one of my favorite Foo Fighters songs of all time. And it really stands out as it it doesn't sound, you know, as the most polished Foo Fighters song of all time. But it stands out to just have all that emotion in there. You listen to White Limo off of that album. And it just sounds like they recorded that in a basement and just had a blast doing it. And when I was listening to the song Cowboys in Nashville by Fastest Land Animal, which you can listen to because it's one of the singles, like I was, and I was picking up on some of the guitar so I'm like, were you listening to Foo Fighters during this? Because I'm feeling like, you know, you got some inspiration from what they were doing with White Limo to just have a blast with this and record it in the most fun way possible so you get that raw human experience and that raw human element in that guitar tone. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, White Limo is a big influence on Cowboys in Nashville. That's pretty apparent. And Hey, White Limo won a Grammy, right, for Song of the Year or something. So they did something right when they. When I, they I know they wanted it for something. I can't remember if it was something or for like a, for the music video or something because the music video was absolutely hysterical. Yeah, when they're all was... in the White Limo, and I think Lemmy from Motorhead's in the limo with them, and then they run over someone in the band or Chris Shiflett or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, they had Lemmy, they had Lemmy. Yeah, I mean that song. That that's a great song, and it's definitely. Uh, it, although I did, in all fairness, Cowboys in Nashville is a song I wrote. Uh, probably about 10 years before White Limo ever came out. And then I recycled it for this album. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, White Limo in that with the, the, the vocal tone that I, that I try to get on that, on that track, which is really hard to do live. It hurts my voice <laughs> and scorches my throat. Uh, but it, uh, yeah, the idea is just to have this like, party like three minute long party screaming your ass off i mean i did write lyrics but the lyrics don't even probably don't really matter that much because you can barely hear what i'm saying 
Um, but have it be this really nasty, horrible sounding thing. And then the chorus all of a sudden is kind of not joyous, but uh, like sort of fun. So it's like you're, the chorus is you're doing shots and then the verses are you're, you're getting sick in the bathroom, I think. Well, I kind of looked at it a little bit of a different way with that same kind of concept, honestly, because I'm just taking a look at the notes that I had when I was listening through because I always write down everything I'm thinking about when I'm listening to these songs. And, of course, you know, that rougher style for the verses that is reminiscent of White Limo, I absolutely loved it. But then when you got to the chorus, like, you kept that same pace. You kept that same kind of, like, party feel going to it. But you didn't clean it, – it's like the vocals got cleaned up. The guitar tone got cleaned up. And between the verse and the chorus, it's – the flow is still very much the same, but you created this different dichotomy just based off of the roughness of the verses versus the more clean crispness of that chorus as well. So you created this like separation between the two, but they flow so well together because the energy between the two just keeps going right through each other. Yeah. Th- well, I also did uh, in the court, the courses have harmonies too. So that makes it sound a little prettier. Um, and, and the, uh, the chords are, are, uh they're i think more major chords whereas in the verses there it's a little more chromatic and i don't think i'm playing minor chords there but they're definitely uh more chromatic um than the choruses but you know that's white limo is the same way the uh the verses are really really nasty and gnarly um and then uh in the choruses and particularly in the bridge of that song it sounds a little more traditional rock and roll um but it's still it's you know there's something really punk about uh about that song no absolutely and it's like even throughout more of the songs you guys have is on this album as well there's a lot of that punk influence in there and how many think about that you know deservedly so just because it does bring more of that rougher more of that human element to it and you know we were talking about the synths as well with you guys working with analog synths it makes so much to kind of have that come through there because it has that raw human emotion to it, but it's because of the rawness. That's what makes it stand out. It's not that it's raw because it has to be raw. That's the way that the production has because of the budget. No, it's raw because it makes sense for it on these songs and it comes through as powerfully because that's how it is. Yeah. I mean, we worked with a, uh, this is, um, we've worked, sorry. My dog, my dog is wants to come in and join me. Hi, Bella. Come on inside. Uh, we worked with this uh, his producer. His name is Don Gilmore, and we've worked with him um, on uh, both Fastest Land Animal Records and on the last, uh, I think it was two, two or three uh, albums on the, at the band I was in before that. Um, so I'm really comfortable working with him. But, you know, he's like, uh, you know, he's not the kind of guy who you're going to do demos with. He's like a real polished producer. He knows what the fuck he's doing. He's great at his job. He did the first uh, couple Linkin Park records. Um, and uh, I think he worked with Eve Six and Lit. And early on, he worked with Soundgarden and Pearl Jam. He comes out of the Seattle scene. So he knows what he's doing. Um, and it's good to have someone like that on a, on a project just because um, when you're in the band, you can never make decisions. You're, you're like, I think I like this version. I like to sing it this way. Um, I don't know if it's right yet. Should I do it again? Should we add a different guitar tone? Should I add harmonies here? Not add harmonies? Should I sing it differently? Uh, Don, um, or I think any good producer, he's the director of the movie. And he says, cut, print, we're done. We got it. Let's move on. And he also helps uh, tremendously with the arrangements of things. Um, early on in the process, we, um, you know, I, most of these songs came out of uh, demos that I would write at home and record at home. Then I would hand them off to Don. And then Don would take the demos and cut them up and say, hey, let's do it this way. Verse, chorus, uh, make that a double chorus, put a bridge in here, come up with a bridge. You need a different bridge. Um, and and so he would puzzle piece these demos together and then we would go from there and record. So I love working with a producer. I, I'm very comfortable and love working with Don. Um, when we do vocals together, it's, it's such a quick, we do, you know, 
And this album and the last album, because of COVID, we did totally remotely. So I was in my studio. And this, this is, I'm going on a tangent here, but this is why we came up with the name East Coast, West Coast, In Between, because I'm on the East Coast uh, here in upstate New York in my studio. Don's on the West Coast, <coughs> our uh, guitar player and bass player. He's, uh, well, he's close to the West Coast. He's in Arizona. And then our drummer is in between. He's in Houston, Texas. So, uh, and we all worked remotely in our studios over, you know, uh, a virtual thing like we're talking mm -hmm. to each other right now. Um, and I have this, Don and I could work and do three, maybe four songs, do all the vocals for those songs a day. Like, that's how quickly we work with Don. And that's how good he is at knowing, okay, we've got it. I'm, I'm going to take what you just did the three takes or four takes we did, I'm going to put them together and it's going to sound great. You don't need to do any more. Um, so it's a really efficient way of working and I'm comfortable working with him because singing is a, the kind of thing where um, more so than playing guitar or playing drums or anything, it's, it's so personal and it's, it's so, you know, you that when you're doing it, you don't want any, you don't want to feel at all uh, inhibited in front of who you're doing it, you know, when you're doing it. And I have no inhibitions when I'm singing to Don. Um, and he, he knows, he knows when I've, when I've got the take, he knows when I could maybe beat the take. Um, and we, we just bang out these vocals, three songs a day. And, uh, it makes it, uh, a, a process that can, can be pretty laborious. He, he makes it, you know, as easy as it can be and as pain free as it can be as well. Say, damn, you guys are efficient as all hell when it comes to recording that stuff. But it <coughs> absolutely speaks to some things that I've heard as well from other uh, producers that I've been able to talk to. And it's when it comes to the vocal set and when it comes to creating that emotion, the vocals are such a strong thing because especially when you're writing lyrics and they have such that personal connection to you it's going to add so much more emotion to that and to have that outside perspective from a producer from potentially knowing where the situation came from, knowing the emotion that you're trying to bring out and getting that outside look of you're hearing it a certain way, but maybe they're hearing it a certain way. And it's, they're coming back and saying, you know, it could be better. They are trying to push you because they want to make sure that those lyrics, that vocal tone, that pattern, everything around there is as believable as possible for the message and the meaning of the song that you're trying to put out there. It speaks volumes to having a producer that can understand that, that can work with you to make sure that you get, that you get the best possible output for what you're trying to do. And if you found one like that, where you're working that efficiently from East coast, West coast, and in between, <laughs> I mean, you struck gold. Seriously, you struck gold. Thanks. Yeah. And you brought up lyrics. He's really, he's really good about, um, creating or he does you know he's really good about making me create the best lyrics i can because um for me my my writing process is i do the music first and then i come up with the lyrics uh after that usually i build uh, i'll build the lyrics around I'll, I'll start singing phonetically to whatever it is i'm writing and then like a phrase will emerge or uh, a word will come out and then i'll start creating out outward from that from that hook or that word or that phrase but you know that it's 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 tough for me to write lyrics it's not like the thing i'm best at um you know i'm not like paul simon or someone but don really will he'll just say these lyrics are not there yet you need to go back and change this and make this more clear and be more visual and do this and do that and he just gets me there you know and uh I need that because I could be really lazy with lyrics and just sing whatever comes to my mind. And I'm like, ah, that's fine. Uh, let's move on. I want to write the next song. And Don doesn't let me, he keeps me honest. He doesn't let me get, me get away with that. He's like, you got to say something here. There's got to be a through line. You got to connect the verse to this chorus. These two phrases have to, like, one has to lead into the next one. And then it's going to come back to this hook. And this hook has to be better. And so uh, that's, you know, another part of, you know, there's different types of producers. <clears throat> there's producers that are engineers uh, that come out of the engineering world. There's producers that um, 
come out of the promotion world. Um, there's producers that come out of the writing world and, and Don kind of has a little bit of all of that going on. Um, so it's, it, you know, I just, it's really, uh, helpful when, when we're putting this album together to have, uh, that set of ears, uh, available to us. Oh, absolutely. You again, like I said, you guys absolutely struck gold with the producer that you found for Fast Land Animal. It absolutely stands to reason when you listen to East Coast, West Coast, in between, with again all the different styles you're working with, and they're all different vocal patterns, vocal tones to make everything stand out. It absolutely speaks volumes to what you guys are able to come up with, but also alongside the producer you're able to work with, just really bouncing ideas off of each other, really taking his constructive criticism on certain things in order to make sure that the songs are coming out the way that you really want them to come out, but you might just not know it yet because you have your mind's potentially in a different place. Like you said, when it came to lyric writing, you want to, you get these lyrics and it's like, okay, I want to go on to the next one, but that's keeping you honest. He's keeping you going. He's keeping you to make sure that what you're writing in these songs and what the lyrics are match the emotion of the instrumentals, make sure everything stands to reason so that when you, us as the listener, when we're listening to it, every single aspect we can pick up on. If you're talking about something that's a little more fun, we can pick up on that fun energy, that fun emotion, and let loose and have a good time, like Cowboys in Nashville. However, if you're trying to go with something a little bit deeper, a little bit more emotional, you know, picking up on where the guitar tones, where the drumming patterns, where everything is coming from to really elevate that feel, want to make sure that your vocals, not only the tone, but the lyrics, match that and can amplify that so that when we're listening to it on the back end, it just hits us like a freight train of just powerful stuff. I mean, you think about all the songs that we all know and love, the songs that we connect with the most. It's because the composition of the vocals, of the instrumentals, and everything put together hits our emotions in such a way where we relate to them so heavily, even if the situation that inspired that song has nothing to do with us, but because the emotion is something that we so strongly can connect with to a specific example in our lifetime, that's where the power of music really comes through. And that's why it's so important, especially for you guys to have that producer as well with Don, because you're pulling out so many of these different emotions. He's seeing it, he's hearing it, making sure you guys absolutely hit on every single step of that. Yeah, I mean, one thing he told me that uh, resonated and that I'll remember is he's like, if you think about the songs you love the most, they're really a lot more simpler than you think they are. And he's like, just be, keep that in mind when you're writing. You don't be too clever by half. Like, think, you know, uh, think of like the great Beatles songs or, um, uh, they're, they're, or, you know, Bob O'Reilly by The Who. There's, there's basically three chords in the whole song. Um, the bridge has an, another chord, but, um, but it's just the whole package together just works. But the simplicity is the, it, that's, can be what makes a song catchy is that it's not so complicated. You know, uh, I, you know, I'm a big prog rock guy as well. I love it, but those aren't the songs that people are like humming when they, you know, drive around in their car or whatever. Um, it's, you know, songs like, uh, um, Hey Jude, you know, that very simple gets to the point, the hooks right up front. Um, and if you listen to a lot of those, those songs, if you think of the great songs, uh, rock songs and pop songs, a lot of them are a lot more simple than they, than you remember them to be. I mean, think about it, probably one, if not the most popular rock song of all time. It's built off of stomp, stomp, clap. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, until the end, there's no, there's no guitars in that song even. And uh, what a great song. Uh, and you hear that in uh, sports arenas all the time to this day. Yeah, I think We Will Rock You is still the number one song played in sports arenas. And I think it's been that way ever since I started keeping track of that stuff since I want to say maybe 2002, 2003. Yeah, I think so. And another Queen song, Another One Bites the Dust. That's that's another one that's it's basically a, a song built around one riff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an amazing riff, uh, but um, but that that song's not complicated, but. Fuck if it's not a great song, you right? I mean, come on. 
Oh, absolutely. And that, and that, uh, that thing just stands the test and that advice stands the test of time. We think you think about it as well, like you said, with prog rock as well. I mean, there's some great prog rock songs and prog metal songs there. Don't get me wrong, but they're very complicated, very complex. Unless you're very tuned into it, you're not just connecting with it. I was even thinking about this as well, especially coming from me loving the punk rock, hard rock, and the metalcore side of things. Thinking about Bring Me the Horizon with uh, Shadow Moses from 2013. It's the the song isn't as complicated as you think it is, but you get to the chorus and it's just the the vocal pattern to it, and then the chanting from the back end. Yeah, it's just a call and response type thing. But that response, especially including the word we in there, it brings so many people together. It's such a simple concept just to have people feel like they're a part of the song. Similar to We Will Rock You with the stomp, stomp, clap. It it, it just brings so many people into it. It has a, such a connection point. And it can be, again, from the simplest pieces of construction around a song, whether it's instrumentally, thematically, or vocally. Yeah, I mean, a, a a good song can hit you in the heart, it can hit you in, in the head, uh, and it can hit you between the legs, but the best songs hit you in all three at the same time, you know, that's that's what it's all about. Oh, man, and I'm thinking about that, too, because I know some of those songs that have hit me in all three, and it's just they've knocked me on my ass to the point where after I've heard them, I've had to sit down and I've said, what did I just listen to? Is <laughs> this a real thing? Am I dreaming right now? Please tell me I'm not dreaming. <laughs> yeah i mean there's so many artists that do like the talking heads are a great example of um an an artist that i mean some of their greatest forget songs like entire albums in fact you know half their catalog their writing process would be such that um they would have one uh sort of rhythm and riff and chord the, the it really wouldn't change and everyone in the band would add a little something to this track so you got a drum beat you got a bass line you got a guitar part then you get another guitar part that maybe is, is a little different than the first guitar part then you have a um some percussion thing some keyboard thing and now you have all your faders on your on your console and you have all these parts now, once that's done, now we're going to write the song. We're going to write the song when we're mixing the song, which is kind of backwards. Usually you write the song, you record it, and then you mix it. But the way the Talking Heads did it was they would record all these different tracks. Then while they're mixing it, they would write the song, and then uh, uh, David Byrne would come up with lyrics and a story and a melody to go over that, which is a really good way to break it down to, uh, you know, really uh, almost primal simplicity because you can't have clever chord changes and you can't change speeds in the middle of a song if everything's already recorded and everyone built it on uh, a you know one bass note basically going on for the, for the entire four minutes of the song but that's where it gets really creative and that's when it gets really interesting and that you know that really hits you definitely in the chest and uh and because of date because david burns such a brilliant guy in the head as well um so i i experiment with that kind of songwriting too which is uh it's really fun and it kind of takes the pressure off in a way because you're not so uh challenging yourself oh my god i have to write the most beautiful clever creative beatlesque uh perfect pop song Instead, you can just create rhythms and beats and you'll, it'll come together and you'll figure it out as, as you keep going down the road. Yeah, instead of trying to build the whole thing at once, you're basically creating all the Legos for it and you're, put, and you're able to rearrange it and put them together in a certain way that's going to make it the way that you want. It gives you that challenge of building something off of something you've already constructed <clears throat> when, when you yeah. do the recording process. And I love what you said about the challenge behind it. It gives a different challenge to it, but I think a key and kind of leading back to something we were talking about earlier, that kind of writing process, which is very unique, especially for the, when it comes to talking heads, it keeps that human element in there throughout because like you oh, said, sure. when you record it, you can't mess with the tempo. You can't change it because those parts are already recorded. They're done. They're in yeah. there. How do we build off of that? Yeah, you're married to it. And, uh, and then... You know, you, don't, you never know what, what's going to 
there, there can be the littlest little uh, keyboard flourish or something, and all of a sudden that becomes the hook, and that steers where the, the direction of where the song's going. Oh, absolutely. And when it comes to Fast Animal, I do want to ask this because I know you do have another interview you have to get to. Excuse okay. me. When it comes to Fast Land Animal, with the release of East Coast, West Coast in between, what can we expect from the band in 2023 following the release? We'll be on the road, as as we do. We were we were touring uh, a bunch before the holiday season, um, and uh, we're going to be going back out and uh, just uh supporting the album and hopefully getting more and more people to listen to it and that you know that's what we love doing the most is playing live i mean there's nothing quite like uh getting the, the immediate feedback from crowds and uh do you know doing a sweaty rock and roll show that that's why we all do this to begin with it's an emotional connective experience that's why we all love going to show so yeah Everyone's got to make sure that they watch out for when Fast Land Animal comes near them because, yeah, there's going to be a lot of good stuff to come off of East Coast, West Coast in between. There's going to be a lot of good stuff that you're going to want to listen to and be like, how the heck did they do this? How are they going to play this live? <laughs> this is how you're going to find out by going and seeing them play live in 2023. We'll, we'll, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure play it out. live. <laughs> we'll figure it out. So, Scream and Jack, as we bring this podcast to conclusion, one thing I'd like to do is give my guests, which is you in this instance, a chance to whatever you want to say, plug whatever you want to plug, promote whatever to promote at the end of the podcast. So, my friend, the floor is yours. My man, we love the Midwest. We love playing out there. We're gonna we're we're gonna where, where's your garage? We're gonna we're gonna just set up shop in your garage and play for you, Kevin, in uh, in Wisconsin, and. Uh, and I'm going to bring my snowboard, so if we get stranded, at least I can get the hell out of there real quickly. Makes sense. Hey, I live in Milwaukee, <laughs> so, I mean, there's plenty of places for you guys to play. We'll, we'll get, I'll just get on the snowboard and ski right down the lake till I get to Chicago, and then I'm going to get some, uh, some hot dogs and deep dish pizza. <laughs> nice. I love it. So, I've got to end this podcast now with three things. First things first, when it comes to Fast Land Animal, yeah, brand new album, East Coast, West Coast, in between, coming out on January 20th. So to make sure you guys are ready for the release of the album and to make sure you guys are ready for them to go on tour and when they come to Milwaukee, right, to make sure you're ready to come to my garage to watch them play, here's what you got to do. Go to the description of the podcast, say find Fastest Land Animal online. There's going to be links for all the places you can find them online, social media accounts, YouTube, where you can buy some merch, where you can pre-order the album, where you can pre-save it, pre all that kind of stuff. And when it comes out, where you can listen to it and listen to all their other music. All that information will be in the description of the podcast under Find Fastest Land Animal online. Links, labels, I'm doing all the hard work. All you got to do is click the link. It'll take you right there. Now it's time for number two, Scream Jack. So whenever it gets to the podcast, I enjoy having the podcast. I tend to make a certain promise to say thank you for taking the time to be on the podcast and for way, a way for me to continue to support the band. Every person that ever had this podcast has hit on this, and you're just going to keep this um, tradition rolling. So my promise to you is when. It's a when because it's going to happen. We just don't know what day or time yet. When I get to see you perform live for the first time, my promise to you is this. First round's on me. Hey, I I'm I'm all about it, man. Perfect. I'll drink, uh, I'll drink some Johnny Walker Black on you, buddy. Perfect. All righty. Well, <laughs> I got to make some more money then. Uh, all right. <laughs> I, we could do doers or, you know. No, no. I'm well, fine. I'm having, well I'm scotch have, is fine. I don't care. Yeah. Whiskey. Any whiskey will do. Per I just have to have some fun with it. So now I cannot end this podcast by saying goodbye because, Jack, I made a promise to you. I plan to keep that promise. I always want to keep my promises. And... This was a lot of fun. I love talking all the crazy production stuff, the songwriting style stuff with you. I would love to back, have you back in the podcast again in the future. So can this be goodbye? Nah, saying goodbye. This is, I'll see you later. Uh, yeah, uh, adieu or a arrivederci. Well done. Woo! Well, folks, that was my interview with Jack Novak, Screaming Jack Novak from the band Fastest Land Animal. Once again, their brand new album, East Coast, West Coast, In Between, comes out the day after this podcast so was on January 20th, 2023. Make sure you're in the note that following along with Fastest Land Animal and are going to go and see them at a venue near you in 2023, maybe in my garage as well. You never know. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to go to the description of the podcast where it says Find Fastest Land Animal online. All the links to their social media is there so you know when they're posted, when they're going on tour, all that kind of stuff. 
links for where you can watch the music videos are in the YouTube link as well. Links where you can support them by buying their merch, pre-ordering their album, pre-saving it, downloading it, buying it, all that good kind of stuff. Description of the podcast under Find Fastest Land Animal Online. You can also find us online with the Corporate Rush Podcast on all social, social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for your viewing pleasure. We're also on YouTube, so please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can watch these interviews literally happen with your favorite artists. You can also listen on Spotify, Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Amazon, and a lot of other places. Thanks to Brit Media because they're helping us out with the audio stream stuff. Thank you, guys. And... If you're subscribed already or just subscribing right now, a huge thank you to you for supporting the podcast. If you're not subscribed, please reconsider, but you're always looking back anytime, so please come on back. You're welcome. Also, I want to thank Phoenix Fitness for sponsoring this podcast. 20% off. Use the code CPP20 at fnxit.com. Link to the podcast. Thank you once again, Screaming Jack, because never thought we'd go this deep in the production side of things, but oh my God, am I glad we did. This is a lot of fun. Can't wait to do it again. Can't wait to have that first round on me. Probably in my garage. So on that note, that's going to be it for you guys. Thank you for listening to the Chord Progression Podcast. My name is Kevin. And you guys know how I end every single one. of the big, healthy, and hearty. See y'all. Yeah.